So cool, let's get started. Hello everyone, it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you fellow Chicago Booth alumni to this global webinar on the tectonic shifts in wealth management. First of all, let me thank uh, Jen Yao and Ben for pulling this off. Uh, it's such a wonderful idea and uh, it was definitely not an easy task to bring us all together for this, but it shows the global spirit, the energy and the ambition of our great Booth community. We will start with a quick round of self-introductions uh, by the panelists, then we will have a discussions for about uh, 30 minutes uh, among the panelists on some key topics. And then we will pass on to you for uh, comments and questions for the remainder. Let me quickly start by introducing myself. My name is Oliver Bantz. I have been in the financial industries for over 25 years, starting off as an attorney, and then after my full-time MBA at the GSD. In 2005, I uh, worked as a management consultant at McKinsey before I went into banking. And after some retail and corporate banking, I uh, was the global chief of staff of UBS Ultra High Net Worth Business. Lately, I have been involved in a series of startups in the fintech and digital asset space. Let me pass the baton to Christina for a quick intro of herself. Thank you, Oliver. Um, hello, my name is Christina Lee. Um, I got my full-time MBA degree from class of 2013. And then since then, I joined uh, Credit Suisse as the in, uh, investment manager for their uh, private wealth uh, uh, business since 2013. And uh, um, now I manage around the 800 million US dollar mainly cover uh, China market. And uh, I spent the first two years in Singapore, also Credit Suisse, and then relocate to Hong Kong in 2015 until now. Um, I got the, um, ranked as uh, their top 10 uh, investment consultant internally for Asia Pacific region uh, in 2017 and then uh, have been one of the key members for their North Asia business to expand the uh, market share in China market. And then uh, um, I would be more than happy to share what I know about uh, North Asia private wealth sectors with you uh, later for uh, the next one hour. And then pass to Ivan. Hello, uh, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Ivan Chalebiev. I grew up between Bulgaria and the US and I was fortunate to attend the University of Chicago um, on a scholarship um, I, in 97, 99. Uh, when I was there, long-term capital um, blew up and it sort of uh, triggered my interest into the hedge fund space, which used to be much smaller, uh, just on the cusp of entering the mainstream. And the hedge fund strategies uh, span the entire Chicago curriculum from behavioral finance to monetary policy to game theory and option pricing and antitrust law. Uh, so I worked in this space uh, for the last 20 years, a third of it uh, in the US, a third of it in Europe, and the last third here in Asia. I was with uh, large institutions like Morgan Stanley, uh, boutiques, family offices, and now I work together with a bunch of boothies. Uh, we run an asset manager focused on the Chicago investment framework, uh, which happens to also leverage the same curriculum. Uh, but in a totally different way. Cool. Very excited to have you guys here on the on the panel. Uh, maybe to start and establish a baseline, let's talk a little bit about the state of the wealth management industry and start. Let's start with Asia. So, Christina, where do you think the industry is right now? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I can give us a uh, give give you guys a, a overview of uh, how the Hong Kong works. So Hong Kong is the, um, of course, the private banking center for, especially for greater China region, including Hong Kong itself, and then China and Taiwan, uh, this market. And then um, the major player, we know that, of course, the budget breaker, uh, brackets, such as UBS, Credit Suisse, and JP Morgan, et cetera, still uh, occupy the bigger market share, but we see uh, the boutique, Swiss bank, and then also the locals still um, um, serve a certain niche market. And then also we see the rising numbers of family offices that we can uh, address more how it developed uh, recently later on. For the business model, we uh, generate our revenue mainly from one is brokerage fee, 
that um, the, from the, uh, especially for Chinese coin, they are very, very active on the trading uh, volume. So the commission is one of our major revenue source. And another big part is the management fee, which is more generated from uh, um, either mutual fund product or those discretionary mandate provided by those banks. And uh, um, this is the overview of Hong Kong. And then, and then uh, I think Ivan can talk about the Singapore. Ivan's on mute. Okay. Uh, the what what you see here in the in the headlines is is obviously um, the the competition between Hong Kong and Singapore, which uh, Hong Kong was. Uh, always very hard to, to compete with. And, and now uh, there are glimmers of hope that it will be a more level playing field. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that's, that's very speculative and I think Hong Kong will remain formidable. Uh, beneath the surface, however, here, I've noticed something else going on. Uh, I'm not ready to call it tectonic yet, but the shift is real and in time it could qualify as one. And, so it's about turning Singapore into a fund management super cluster. Um, Cayman right now is the gold standard for institutional investors. And um, for US investors, it's offshore, but conveniently nearby. Um, here where we live, um, it's on the other side of the world and there's 2 billion people. It makes no sense to, to them. Uh, it's a historical accident, uh, you know, um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And, but it's the status quo. And actually I run a, a Cayman structure and I've never been to the Cayman Islands and no reason, uh, business reason to go there. Uh, so there has been a, an effort by the government over the last five years um, to bring together the entire ecosystem of administrators, independent directors, and uh, lawyers, so uh, not just matching the, the, the tax advantages, but really creating something that would be um, uh, an alternative to, 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 to Cayman. And it, it makes sense, um, I think. Uh, it's, it's a government initiative, so speed is not the distinguishing feature, but it's pretty comprehensive in scope. And it includes uh, subsidies along the entire value chain. Um, and uh, I don't know if Bridgewater is going to redomicile a hundred billion dollars here, uh, but the, the government can take the long view. And uh, there's a lot of growth here in terms of um, new sources of wealth. So if, if I think the next Bridgewater will probably uh, originate from, from this region and so um, you know, as someone who, who came from, from the U.S. And, and Europe, the first thing that hits you when you come here is uh, how alive this, this place is. And um, so I think it would be a very good compliment to Hong Kong because uh, Singapore will always be offshore to China uh, and offshore to really every other place. It, it sort of reminds me of the way Switzerland used to be uh, maybe a hundred years ago, um, where it's a high quality place <laughs> that people can visit and also park their, their uh, uh, gold bars uh, and, <laughs> and as, well, as well as their cash. Yeah, it, it still is. It's still a great place and you can still store your gold bars and cash and whatever you have. You can even buy, uh, buy real estate here in very nice places. Um, yeah, just to round, round, round up, I mean, Europe is a little less dynamic, of course. Uh, it has a very well-established and mature business. It's so established and mature that we don't even need slides to explain it uh, <laughs> for all the public. New wealth is growing very slowly, <clears throat> and the hunt of assets uh, in the industry is mainly through a competitive effort uh, against or among incumbents making entire teams move around uh, established players. So that game still still going on. Europe is well overbanked. Uh, most of the services come out of banks or part of the banks. Um, clients are slow in moving around, changing changing uh, their, their banks or their uh, service providers. Uh, but there is a broad industry around independent wealth advisors and multifamily offices. 
You see disruptors uh, on the lower end of the market, <clears throat> mainly in retail and as technology provider for large established players in the affluent space. Uh, so the situation in Europe has been driven over the last 10 to 20 years largely to a, a degree of regulatory crackdown on tax evasion and money laundering. And I wonder, uh, Christina, how does the situation look like in Asia? And in particular, I mean, these days everybody talks about Hong Kong and, sure. and their legal situation. And, and what, yeah, what, so, what, are, what are the changes that we have to expect? Yeah, sure. I, I think this, um, I would say in the past, uh, since I joined this industry, a lot of things just happened. I would say, I, I think private wealth management sector is one, one of the key factors to drive this industry it is definitely regulation. So, for example, the, the tax, the, the transparency requirement on the offshore assets, um, these are the factors to drive those uh, wealthy individuals to uh, you know, look for the professional banking, private banking services. So, so the um, the example I would like to talk about is CRS. Uh, in the slides, I give the um, the detailed definition of CRS. So basically, uh, CRS stands for Common Reporting Standard. Uh, I, I think uh, the uh, audience can can uh, check the definition here. But basically, it means uh, as long as in the CRS agreement. The, the different countries would automatically change their citizens' banking account information with each other. So this is um, actually the key drivers, uh, um, like what happened in China market in the past five years. So the Chinese government implemented the new anti-tax evasion the regulation from uh, 2018 September. But the, the, the financial institution in China start to gather all their banking information from 2017 January. So I covered China market for, for seven years. But um, I, from that, that moment on, I can see like a chi uh, Chinese clients really start to look for private banking professional service and then start to learn to set up the trust by the insurance, better plan their assets offshore. Uh, for for to pass to to the next several generations, and then um, I think the regulations really highly relevant to the different global booking centers. So the uh, um, back then a uh, very uh, um, I would say um, special example is like Singapore government really try to um, build itself as the favorable. Um, places for those wealthy individuals, for example. So at that time, Singapore government launched the policy that as long as you set up the trust in Singapore and then manage under the um, professional investor way, for, for example, like a bank's discretionary mandate, then the responsibility to report your account is actually not on the bank. It becomes like they provide the incentive that um, the individual can be the one to bear the responsibility to report your account. And back then it, it really attract a lot of Chinese clients to, to put their money and set up their trust and discretionary mandate account in Singapore. And then um, the uh, Chen Yao, can, can we go to the next slide please? And then I can see um, in the future uh, from an Asian family's perspective, the booking center, um, the, um, the regulation will be highly relevant to how the different booking center um, develop. So for example, we know um, the unrest that happened in Hong Kong um, the, the last year, uh, second half of 2019, it, it, it really in, um, caused quite a huge amount of private wealth outflow to, to other locations out of Hong Kong, to be honest. And then the, the destinations including uh, one big part is going to Singapore. And then the second second destination is still Switzerland. And then another is the, the what's following is US and UK. So Singapore has the advantage to, to get those outflow because uh, within the same time zone, convenient for those clients to communicate with their bankers. And uh, um, another reason is a lower language barrier as well. And then for Switzerland, it, it's also like a huge part. And then I, I think Switzerland still serve um, like they still have a prestigious image among those Asian families. And then uh, an interesting part is US demand is also um, not small actually. 
So uh, the, the reason is U.S. is one of the only few countries that didn't sign the CRS, the, the exchange information agreement with China. So for certain family, it provides a really, really good privacy for them. And also like maybe their second generation or third generation already become U.S. person. And then I, I think for um, the last part, the U.K., um, the, the, the demand is smaller, but the, um, still there because um, the really low uh, sterling pounds uh, attract a lot of wealthy family to acquire the properties there. And also for the immigration purpose. And then um, I think for Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong, the outflow is um, quite huge last year, but I think, you know, money usually has a short memory. And then uh, I think Hong Kong still have a, a good position as one of the, the, the booking center for those wealthy family is um, because usually for Asian family, their um, business, they still need the, um, the money just, you know, around the greater China region. So Hong Kong is the, of course, the capital hub for the greater China region. And another reason um, it is huge is that uh, a lot of Chinese corporation come back to Hong Kong for due listing because the in intention between US and China relationships. So um, this IPO uh, withdrawal, those like subscription is one of the favorite activity of those uh, wealthy Chinese family. So, so I think Hong Kong still serve uh, um, for a certain specific purpose for those uh, privacy walls uh, as one of the privacy walls booking center. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Um, mm -hmm. With that, actually, um, and just to round that up, I think I think Asia, more or less, Hong Kong and Singapore follow the same development that we've seen over the last. 10, 15 years here in Europe. And I mm -hmm, think it's mm -hmm. more and more clear that you cannot simply bet on hiding anything yes, from yes. any government. Sooner or later, it'll, yeah. it'll come out. You can basically make sure that you have separated your wealth and you 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 distributed it and you can make it a lot secure than, than, than before. Sure. But definitely, you, you cannot hide it from the government over the long run. Yeah, and that concerns that. in particular the family offices, which is a very interesting space Mm -hmm. for for uh, the, the industry because you make a lot of money with family offices not necessarily on terms of profit per assets um, as as one of the main gorges everybody looks at but finally the overall uh, profit pool that you get from serving family offices through cross-selling and and serving them on the whole breadth of True. potential True. services is, is enormous and we've seen a rise in, in family offices in, in, in Asia. Can you comment a little bit on that one? Sure. Um, so so uh, I, have, I, I have to say uh, uh, Chinese clients learn very, very fast. Uh, if compared to maybe Europe or, or US, I would say maybe family office market here in Hong Kong or Asia still lag a few years behind like Europe or US, but it grows very, very fast. Uh, I think that it's just driven by the several factors. One is uh, um, a lot of seasoned bankers, they accumulate a certain amount of uh, uh, clients and then they, they want to maybe, um, you know, upgrade the service, like more flexible, not just only tied to certain bank, their platform. Then they would just bring all these uh, clients and then set up their own family offices. And then the, um, the second factor is actually those ultra high net worth individuals. They they learn very they also learn very fast, and then they want to have a more flexible platform. And then the product and service they want to have uh, more different options they can invest in. They can look into. So they even some of the what I learned is uh, if the asset size is big enough and then they would just hire the uh, investment specialist by themselves and set up their own family uh, office. And then third, third, uh, third part is actually banks already see this trend is coming. So they also uh, offer the um, trading platform and then the custodian service for those um, uh, family office or we call that like uh, external asset manage management, EAM, those um, firms to, to pack their money uh, with and then and then work with those banks. So um, yeah, I, I think this trend is very obvious and then driven by different these three major factors. 
serving family office is actually not that not that easy. So you have to be you have to have a certain size. They have certain demands. Uh, in particular, they want they want trading. They want access. Some of the younger members of the families, they really want to have a digital offering where they can trade themselves. They want to see that part of the of the portfolio if they have one separated. Um, so so that generally speaks for larger players. Um, but is that true? In your view? Will the larger players like UBS, mm -hmm. Credit Suisse, will they win that battle or is there a chance for smaller, smaller players as well? Um, I would say uh, actually definitely um, there are still chances for those smaller players. Um, I think it just, um, for, for, for example, like what I mentioned, the, the seasoned banker, they bring out their clients to set up the firm. Uh, I would say it's also um, the the like um, big bank like UBS or or Credit Suisse or J P Morgan, they they definitely have the resource to acquire the more new clients. But if um, the bankers um, or the clients they have a long term relationship and then um, they know what they really are looking for, um, there are definitely possibility for them to set up their own firm. And then uh, um, I can see um, it's actually already happening in Europe and US. And then what happened here in Asia is um, the, the, the numbers is in, in increasing. And then um, actually this, the, the beauty of, uh, I would say the beauty of private wealth is that um, the, um, they are always possibility for those smaller players. Uh, especially if they have the relationship, they know how to acquire the clients. And then um, another thing is, um, it's indeed for family offices, they have more flexibility to pick um, the products and then the, the, the service they can provide to their clients. Mm. It's, um, it's just, it has been a trend over the last few years that the richer got richer. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the richer got so much more rich that actually the amount of money you have to invest really uh, puts out the real challenge. So if a new client oh. comes or even existing clients and can make an additional amount of money just by selling part of their businesses or, or even mm -hmm. you know, uh, just float an additional part of, of an existing public business, yeah. the amount of money that you would have to invest, that's almost only possible for very large institutions to do that in a, in a sophisticated yeah, way. So there will be, there will, if you really look at the, the largest family offices and the richest people are really at the ultra, ultra business, mm -hmm. I think there will be definitely, definitely a consolidation or, or just a focus on the more, uh, on the more bigger. Yeah, players. true. Agree. At the yeah, same I time, I fully agree with you. The smaller players, they will always have a chance. There will, you know, there will be uh, different levels, levels of wealth. And, and interestingly, the, the the whole market, the whole industry is still very, very fragmented. Yeah. Cool. Maybe let's pass on to the to the current situation and um, and COVID nineteen and and, mm -hmm. and what 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 you uh, both of you think about how the pandemic um, influenced and influences the wealth management business. Maybe Christina again, and then we give mm -hmm. a little bit more more airtime to to Ivan. But yes, but sure. Asia has been on the on the on ahead of the curve, like it or not. <laughs> On this one, and, and I think it's certainly very interesting to hear how how everybody reacted uh, when it yeah. started. Interestingly, as we just discussed before, I'm totally flabbergasted by the fact that nobody saw that coming. So not even not even the big, large global players who had tons of, of antennas out there in the Chinese market and, and, mm -hmm. and serve a lot of very wealthy Chinese, they didn't see it coming. So. Uh, what what happened at the beginning and then how, how did clients feel and react and, and how was that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would love to share what I also uh, learning. I would say I learning by doing. So this year is really interesting is um, the COVID-19 um, bring the difficulty for our business. The, the, the part is um, because the quarantine policy that we, we are, um, it's getting harder for us to travel to meet new clients. So for, for us, it, it, it's pretty difficult for us to bring the uh, new clients into our business. But actually um, the transaction uh, activity is massive. 
So I have to say the Chinese client, then they also, they are very, very smart. And then they learn from the past experience, especially from financial crisis and, and SARS 17 years ago. So uh, in February, when um, the, the, um, the COVID-19 just start to outbreak in domestic China, I still remember uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange dropped by like 8%. And then at that time, a lot of clients just call in and they ask us what to buy. And they, they are so excited about that opportunity. And then so, so they bought several things, but got burned again, of course, in March, uh, during the big sell off in Wall Street. But after that, they just, they, they still have the like a uh, spirit to continue to ask for what to buy. So actually they, they are very excited about this uh, opportunity to buy at a dip. And then the transactional uh, activity is just uh, huge. And then to be honest, private bank make quite a lot of money this year for those like uh, very active transactional activity. And then of course, uh, later on, Ivan can talk more about the, the market um, because a lot of central bank, they try to save the market and then to, to launch those stimulus policy. So the, the stock market and then the gold, et cetera, um, just go up so a lot like unseen and then already passed the pre-crisis level. And then the finally, of course, technology play a, a more important role because uh, we cannot really face, um, meet our client face to face. So now we, we kind of like start to do a lot of VC meeting, which is never really happened before, especially uh, to be honest, Chinese client never really, you know, did the uh, um, uh, like video conference with us before, but now we, we kind of like get used to it. And also they start to adapt those online banking to place the order. Yeah, so it's, this year is really interesting. That's uh, very fast, fascinating and, and definitely <laughs> seen large, large swings in, large swings in the market, uh, trading mm -hmm. activity high and then people went into cash and then out again and, and started yeah, to start. They are, you again. have no idea how excited they are when the market just dropped. It's like mm -hmm. they, they, they are so excited to know what we think, what to buy at that time. And then, so I still remember we recommend like Tencent, those all uh, online, you know, new technology can benefit from this quarantine environment. Tencent, Meituan, and then JD, all this online shopping platform. And of course, those are online gaming names. Yeah. Another interesting aspect is that large wealthy players uh, who had either dry powder or were able to leverage, they exactly, had a huge opportunity exactly. to get into the market. And yeah. again, for the, for the players in the wealth management side, it's uh -huh. really interesting in how they either are strong on the credit side, if they were going into a pandemic and had a lot of loans out there, they probably had, they had to cut back a little bit, were probably a little bit more, uh, more cautious. Others that yeah. had not had tightened before, maybe had conservative risk views, were able to expand. And, and that's what we've mm -hmm. sure. seen from UBS. UBS, a more conservative bank, was able to expand during, during uh, the first a few weeks of the pandemic and then we're able mm -hmm. really to, to help clients get in there and position themselves in the, in the market. Sees that yeah, true. Opportunity. Now, given, given a gigantic central bank intervention, however, um, money is going everywhere and uh, it's difficult to predict, but nevertheless, I think Ivan, you are, uh, you are guiding us through what we should do with our money now going forward. No? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, the main, the main takeaway for me is that, uh, this is a, it's a very strange and very liquidity driven juiced up market. And it's also moving at warp speed. So you can see what's, what's coming. Um, in, in March, the global market completely ignored what was happening in, in, in China, sorry, in February. And then in March, suddenly uh, it became a global phenomenon. So the idea of market timing is, is, is even more compromised than it ever was. Uh, but also, as Christina said, you can't afford to stay out. And a part of it is because something like a pandemic is definitely going to be solved. It's going to be solved through vaccines, through behavior changes, treatments, and there'll be systems put in place so that such a, a pandemic can never take the world by surprise 
um, in anything that resembles what, what we went through. So in a way, we know how the movie ends, but we don't know how long it takes. And there is a lot of uncertainty. And so um, this is, if, if you think about in business cycle terms, uh, everything about this particular recession is unique. First of all, it's caused by a virus as opposed to the usual um, late cycle uh, f phenomena where businesses simply overexpand and then they have to cut back. Uh, the depth of the phenomenon is uh, the worst in a hundred years. The duration is the shortest in a hundred years. Uh, the size and scope of the stimulus uh, is similar to the Second World War, where the government is basically on war footing and they feel that they're being attacked. And, you know, we will fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the mountains. And um, they are very aggressive um, and they're not going to give up until they win. So there is no limit. Uh, which is very, very unusual. The market reaction is, has also was very sharp on the way down and very sharp on the way up. Uh, but the ramifications, which is damage to the, the fabric of the economy and uh, uh, social issues, uh, inequality, uh, Oliver, as you mentioned, uh, and the geopolitical fallout, these are things that we're going to be dealing with for the next five years. So... It's different in terms of um, the downturn so far, but also it's very far from over. And we've had a liquidity driven rally, uh, but in the end, the, the fundamentals always dominate. And this time around, the fundamentals are very, very weak. So the longer term implications for me is that the recessionary impact will take much longer to unfold. This thing is not over by any means. It's not going to end with a vaccine. Uh, reversing globalization uh, is not a zero-sum game. It's a negative-sum game. It's very expensive. It's going to hit profit margins. It's going to hit employment rates. It's going to hit consumers. And it has strategic implications. Uh, it, it sets us up for living in a more troubled world. Uh, that means that people will fight about how to divide the pie as opposed to working to make the pie bigger for everyone. And they're going to be higher taxes. Some of them are explicit because the, the stimulus uh, will have to be paid for. Some of them are implicit. Savers are, are being penalized because uh, of low interest rates. And um, because the, the, the drop and the retracement has been so sharp, the weekends, you know, the Enrounds and Lehmans of, of this particular period have yet to be revealed. So um, my view is that the volatility is here to stay. And um, let me just, I want to show you a couple of uh, pictures uh, so you can see how dramatic the intervention has been. So uh, this, this is the classical stimulus playbook. Uh, usually, uh, I'm using here the U.S., uh, but it's analogous for, for other markets. So, so this is um, uh, the, the line shows you uh, time zero is when a recession uh, actually begins. And then you have um, in the 90s, uh, you had Paul Volcker and then Alan Greenspan um, uh, in the late 90s. Um, and you can see it took them almost a year to, 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 to do something about it because it took a while to detect that there is a recession. And then uh, if you flip to the next slide, you have Ben Bernanke. So, so Ben Bernanke uh, was dealing with a systemic risk. He was also informed by the Japanese experience. So he was much more aggressive. He did twice as much as his predecessors. And then if you go one slide forward, um, you will see the Powell playbook, what I call. And this is just step one. Um, and so he did double what Bernanke did, and he did it in, in virtually no time. So this is a massive injection of, of liquidity um, because the, the event was so spectacular. In a way, it's similar to 9-11 because everyone sees it happening. 
all around the world. Everyone's talking about it. And the fiscal response has been just as uh, fast and just as furious as the monetary response here. And the U.S. is really, um, unlike other times, the U.S. is really representative of what happened in Germany, in the U.K., uh, as well as in Japan and in China. So, so, so that's step one, just flood the market with liquidity. And step two is render all low risk instruments, high risk. And so you do this by fixing the price of any income generating instrument that's not exposed to catastrophic risk below the rate of inflation. So any low, any risk-free instrument or low risk such as, you know, uh, corporate bonds by Apple uh, or Toyota, uh, in addition to most government bonds, they're guaranteed to return something that's below the rate of inflation. So it's a definite loser and it pushes people into uh, stock. So this chart shows you the uh, pr proportion of S&P um, stocks that pay a dividend that's higher than the 10-year bond. Mm -hmm. And you can see how sharp the increase was and also how dramatic. And so the result, uh, if, if we can see on the next picture, is you have a very narrow market. So this chart shows you on the y-axis returns. So this is global equities and you have <clears throat> a number of them are positive, some of them are negative. And then you have the allocation, <clears throat> which is the size. So size is the weight of, of these companies in global markets. and it, it shows you the, uh, not just the returns, but if you multiply the two, it gives you the net dollar PNL, the total amount of, of profit that investors are getting on the market. And you can see that it's extremely highly concentrated. Now, um, if, if the recovery has legs, the rally will broaden and interest rates will begin to, to drift up and, you know, uh, industrials, banks, even airlines will outperform. Uh, Tencent and Google are not going to collapse, but they're not going to be as special anymore. Uh, but uh, so, so that's what uh, the, the bet is right now. And, you know, consider the fact that something like the NASDAQ is up, uh, almost 80% from the bottom. So it's made Christina's clients uh, very happy um, <laughs> on the new investments they made. Um, the NASDAQ, as well as uh, the tech around the world, basically, um, it's up 30, 40% year to date. So it's not just break even, it's year to date. This is not all time highs. This is 40% above all time highs. And the thing that is, is really interesting to consider is that without COVID, this wouldn't be the case most likely. Because you wouldn't have this narrow market, you wouldn't have this stimulus, you wouldn't have interest rates at zero, um, which leads to um, the um, the earnings of growth companies, which are way out into the future, um, uh, it, it, it makes them much more palatable as opposed to companies that are generating cash in the here and now. I mean, the question really is um, um, whether you really can say what's going on except for the tide lift all boats as uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, famously says. I mean, there's so much money out there and uh, the central banks are pumping so much money into the whole system by buying assets themselves, in particular uh, <coughs> corporate bonds and equities. That Can you really, I mean, can you really give any advice except for just tag along? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I have a lot of advice uh, to give. So if you, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is basically what I would refer to as the standard allocation framework for family offices, endowments, foundations. Um, and, you know, each of us is running a family office. So 
our portfolio should look something like this. Now you can argue about the proportions. <clears throat> you can further subdivide and, and insert venture capital and your art collection in there. Uh, but you know, uh, this basic framework was anchored by a large uh, allocation to bonds. And bonds had this very peculiar feature that they would give you a nice yield. And when stocks drop in a big way, they would give you a nice pop. Uh, so even though their average rate of return is low, over the last 20 years, bonds have outperformed stocks. They're boring, but they just don't go down. Now, with rates at zero, this thing, um, this huge chunk of, of the typical institutional or family office portfolio has only downside. So the challenge is to replace it. If you look at the rest of the components and you think back about the narrow market chart I was showing you, uh, you can take all these boxes and subdivide them into individual managers. Um, everyone is really pushing the envelope in terms of their mandate. So the real estate guys are going heavy in things like uh, Airbnb, which is tech. And until recently, WeWork, which is also tech, but qualifies as real estate. Hedge funds are very, very heavy into the Amazons and um, um, Apples of the world. And the same goes for private equity. So there's this huge drift of these things that are public equity, private equity, real estate, hedge funds, venture capital, they're all levered on growth. And bonds used to provide the ballast and that's no longer there. So the challenge is to find a substitute for that. And, and it's, it's not easy. Um, the key is having some sort of a strategic allocation and sticking with it which means rebalancing, which means adding to, to the losers and taking away from the winners. So now you should sell some of your pin duo duo and your uh, Amazon and, and buy something that is more boring. And the other one is just diversification across every dimension of, of risk. Um, in the people that we speak to in the region, home bias is a huge problem. Um, it's so obvious, but everyone Speaking seems to Speaking of diversification, all... Ivan, just to, to speed up a little bit, um, any views on the asset classes that are not on your chart here? Uh, I mean, gold and, and digital assets, Bitcoin and whatever. Well, sure, yeah, if you go to the next Very slide. Very quickly on that one, uh, please. Sure. Uh, so everyone's talking about gold now, and I think a big part of the reason why they're talking about it is that it's an all-time high. Uh, two years ago, I would understand bringing up gold as uh, some sort of a contrarian uh, expression of tail risk hedge. Uh, today, it's to me, it's it's more of a belief system than an investment strategy. Um, it, if you look at the data, it doesn't have a negative beta to uh, to equities. Uh, if you're concerned about the dollar, there is a way to directly short the dollar. If you're concerned about inflation, you can um, uh, short inflation. If you're concerned about the world uh, collapsing into chaos, you can you can go along the VIX and so on. Uh, this chart shows you gold in different currencies, and you can see that even though gold is quoted in dollars, um, in other currencies, it's uh, the, the run has been far less impressive. And if you skip to the next one. Um, you know, they used to call it black gold. Um, it's the kind of gold that no one talks about anymore because it literally went to zero. It's only seven years ago that Exxon was the world's largest company. And people thought it was as indomitable as Amazon is today. Mm -hmm. Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell, they're going to generate incredible cash flow um, as, as far as the eye could see. And uh, Exxon just got kicked out of the Dow Jones index last night. Um, so it's the rationale for buying these things to me is, um, is, 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 uh, is very slippery. So yeah, going from black gold to digital gold, 
uh, th th this is a replica of a chart that came out in the Wall Street Journal about two or three weeks ago. And uh, it, it's changed the conversation. So the conversation was all about uh, equities and gold. Um, and so then Bitcoin had a huge run up and suddenly Bitcoin was in the conversation. Uh, and of course, Ethereum makes Bitcoin look completely flat. So I understand that, you know, blockchain is, is it's, it's exciting, uh, but after all, it's just an accounting innovation. And as, as exciting as you can get about an accounting innovation, um, at some point you have to ask, how do you turn this into a strategy? And if, you're, if your strategy is to put 1% of your net worth into gold or Ethereum, you know, it's, it's hard to argue with that. Um, but beyond that, um, to me, it's, I don't know, Oliver, what your view is, but I kind of find it hard to uh, reason with, with, with that as, as becoming a, a meaningful uh, part of a, a multi-asset class portfolio. Well, it, you, you know, it, it doesn't go away. I mean, Bitcoin has been here for 10 years and, and it certainly mm -hmm. just doesn't, doesn't go away lightly uh, anymore in the, in, in the future. The question really is, what, what is it? Is it the technology? Is it an enabler for something? Is it an asset class? Uh, what is it exactly? And when we talk about asset classes here, um, it's, it's an interesting comparison to, to gold because um, there's some really good similarities. Um, the gold at some point in history had they had a use case. Bitcoin has not. I mean, um, unless you use it as a means of means of exchange or payment, uh, more for arms, uh, porn, and whatever. I mean, in a more dark, uh, dark, uh, dark way. But it hasn't. It hasn't evolved into a payment system. Maybe uh, Ripple will, uh, but it hasn't been super successful so far. Libra hasn't really taken off. Um, but the question really is, and a lot of enthusiasts talk about the stock and flow model, which is a supply side model, that the demand has to be propped up. It's more like, I compare it more to snake oil. Um, you know, you have these people running around the West and trying to make people believe that snake oil is good for something. Well, you know, that's, that's the case today. There are a lot of ideas, a lot of fantasies around, and people need to prop it up. Um, mm -hmm. That's why either outperform, because either... There is this um, uh, uh, staking model behind it, so you can actually make money with an either. So maybe there's something more behind it than to Bitcoin. Um, we'll, we'll see. It's not going. It's not not going to go away. Uh, it's not ruling the world either because it should have by now. Um, but it will be. It is there and definitely fascinating, as you, as you said, is the technology. Technology can be used for a lot of. But, Again, a lot of people are overestimating the technology. It's not so complicated either. Um, it I mean, takes a it's, while to get into it, but it's not. Yeah, it's really not it, a rocket science. It's back office innovation, right? To some degree, that's that's definitely the case. I got a lot of questions uh, around the future of the industry, and this is exactly what we're uh, we're mm -hmm. slightly running late, to be honest. What we wanted to talk about. Where is the where is the industry heading? And and maybe I'm I'm, I'm shooting off here, um, starting a little bit with your remarks, uh, just answering a few of the questions that that uh, that came up here, interestingly, and I think that's 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 basically where this chat or this 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 conversation should go. Where 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 do we see the industry? The industry is wholly fragmented. There has been a successful trend in the ultra high net worth uh, space. Uh, we see a lot of digitalization. But at the end of the day, you make money through people. I mean, if you really want to invest a lot of money, at some point you need the person. Uh, and I think that's where there's still an edge for wealth management in the future. If you can combine the digital trends, a digital innovation um, together with the human touch and, and know-how. Uh, and on also, I very much believe in the combination of various forms of services. So if you can combine trading, investment banking, you know, helping helping entrepreneurs, corporate banking, together with a, a very knowledgeable way in investing and telling people what to do with the money or, or helping them invest it. I think that's a great combination that will not go away lightly. But I personally see, see the con consolidation will have to come um, because it's a very fragmented uh, mm. market. Any views from, from you, maybe Christina? 
Uh, I totally agree with you. I, I think the good news for, for us in this industry is that I really don't see technology would totally replace the human being uh, for private wealth management. Because for those, um, I, I think they still, for, for those high, ultra high net worth individual or family, they still need to need someone, need a human to really understand what they need. And then sometimes uh, once you involve in this business for several years, uh, you will start to understand uh, a lot of, for example, like um, their um, issues or how they hope they manage their asset or how they, for example, like they are more and more uh, on demand for philanthropy, et cetera, those charity, this is totally cannot be replaced by technology. So I think uh, for the advisors and the relationship managers, they still have a very uh, important roles in this industry. And then uh, another thing I want to share is that um, I see um, the, the cost. It's also relevant to the consolidation. The cost of, uh, of this industry would, would be mainly from uh, actually regulations. Also, uh, again, regulations, because uh, um, especially for the, those end-time money laundry requirement from those regulator, the bankers, uh, the big bank have to uh, um, spend a quite a, a amount of expense on those, maybe for those background check, KYC to make sure their clients are safe and, and clean, et cetera. So actually um, in the past uh, several years, I see the threshold for the private bank amount uh, is getting increased, uh, both in, for example, UBS and Credit Suisse. They, they need to make sure the amount at a certain threshold so that they can cover the cost to manage each account. And then I also want to share with which is which is true for any 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 other industry. I, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. Only, you know that this is an argument that always comes up, um, and I had endless discussions in banking around that. Yeah, I always tell people it's true. really funny when when you when you serve large customers and and uh -huh. corporate customers, you realize that in any other industry, there's a lot of regulation. You have to deal with the regulation, and yes. the banks just need to get their hands around and make it smooth and make it. Yeah good experience for customers and put the cost down. This, this become a huge uh, cost for, and then we, we, we always say that time is money. So now actually a lot of bankers have to spend a lot of time to do all this administration work. So actually this is actually, I, I think another reason why there are more seasoned bankers who are ready to set up the family office because under the um, institutional in, uh, you know, investor structure, um, those administration work can actually reduce a lot. And then the final interesting part I would like to share is that um, I would say um, for those regions, I, I think we always want to um, find the, you know, the market that are still underdeveloped. And then I see um, the beauty of private wealth management is that um, a lot of regions for example, maybe Southeast Asia or uh, some developing area, there are huge uh, amount of opportunities there, especially for the government is less regulated. <laughs> and then um, that their uh, wealthy family, they really have a strong need to better manage their asset offshore. And then they, they are usually very, very, um, you know, generous to pay the premium. So, so um, actually I can see lots of bank for their uh, so-called international wealth management business cover, for example, Middle East, Latin America, or Southeast Asia, Th uh, those market is growing. And I, uh, why I want to mention this is actually, uh, um, I, I think this is a, a, a good, area that for those um, more like with entrepreneur uh, spirit person want to develop uh, or raising the fund or develop the business uh, this is definitely the reason that um, you, you can you can give it a try <laughs> okay cool um, we got some questions on tech maybe maybe one thing on one thing on tech I'm 
let's put it like that. I'm, I'm kind of, I grew a little bit skeptic about all these disruptors mm -hmm. in FinTech, mainly because of one thing, I think at the end of the day, technology needs to serve the customer and it needs to, done, to, be, to be done with people usually because at some point and you see that with all the all the more successful fintech fintech and disruptor they become more and more licensed they become more and more like all the others uh, they have um uh, online services you can call them and so you need to have an integrated service and um, a client at the end of the day wants convenience with professionalism and and ultimately also performance off the cost and that's kind of that's kind of a thing everyone is converging to at some point. So if you're a small fintech with a good idea, uh, you might either get sold to a bigger one uh, because of your technology, or if you grow bigger, then you need to serve the customer and then you need to grow bigger, hire people, get license and all kinds of stuff. I think, I think there are a lot of Pochenkin villages out there, honestly. There are a lot of fintech and companies who prop up good ideas and then look great, but... Um, at the end of the day, if you look at it from a from a customer point of view, uh, the customers Christina serves and and most of the wealth management customers, they want for a good price a good service and as digital as possible. But if 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 something gets complicated, they want to talk to somebody. So that combination is really key, and everybody works a little bit on that combination. But I I think nobody has finally found the secret sauce yet. What I always find really fascinating in this industry, it's, it's a lot of um, lamenting, it's a lot of complaining. Uh, I think the industry should be more positive and you know, combine, give a positive attitude about things and markets and technology and people and make everybody happy. Um, I think this is sometimes what I, what, what I like, but that's more of an emotional, emotional statement. Mm, agree. We got an interesting question around what, um, uh, Jackson Hole starts today. Oh, totally virtually. Um, and and uh, what what would you have to what we have to expect from from Jackson Hole? Do you have a, a view on that, Ivan? Uh, from Jackson power. Hole. Oh, yeah. There's the there's the, well, there's the summer gathering in Jackson Hole of all the central right, bankers, and right. economists. Well, they're doing it online, so. Um, uh, I mean, in, I remember very well when they did it in 2008 um, and Lehman went under a month later. So it's, I, I, I don't want to speculate on, on what will come out of it. I think um, th there is this great quote by uh, Jerome Power, Powell that um, people are making great sacrifices by staying at home. Uh, business owners are shutting down and this is all done in the in the name of public health and the regulators are supposed to make them whole and this is similar to Mario Draghi's statement uh, about 10 years ago that uh, we'll do whatever it takes actually it reminds me of Churchill right um, when you're under attack and literally the airlines are out of commission. You, you have to go all out and bring it back online and build it back better. And once victory is guaranteed, then we'll figure out who pays the bill. Yeah, that the bill will come at some point. Um, I think what I what I think is important around that that discussion is that it's more it's more a fiscal problem right now going forward than a monetary problem. I would mm. say, um, except for the fact that central banks will will try to keep interest rates low as long as possible. Uh, with a little bit inflation or whatever inflation does, but if, if they start increasing interest rates, we'll have a huge debt problem. So most probably, most probably there will be a monetary intervention for a long time to make sure interest rates stay low. Um, yeah, so in, interest rates have been on a downtrend for about 40 years. And before that, they were on an uptrend for 40 years. So um, the... You know, when, when I mentioned before that bonds have outperformed equities over the last 20 years, even though they don't grab the headlines, 
um, it's you've had this secular compression of, of interest rates. And uh, now we are in, 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 you know, uh, into Alice in Wonderland territory. So nobody knows what's going to happen. And you have valuations of uh, uh, whether it's Austria issuing a hundred year bond. How do you think of a bond in an industry where the average investor in that bond has a 10 year uh, at his uh, employer of two and a half years. He's purchasing bonds that mature in a hundred years. And then you look at, at something like Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. Is Tesla, I mean, this, this is something that doesn't make sense as a car company, right? Because they make very few cars. They're worth, they're worth more than all other car companies combined. So you have to, you have to dig very deep, right? And um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's, I, I think we're in an interesting spot. Absolutely. Maybe uh, going back to the questions, I got a few questions around um, uh, the situation for staff in, in the wealth management industry. So if you're a booth graduate or if you're trying to get into or re-enter into the wealth management industry and, and how, how's, how's the situation there. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, and I'll pass that on to, to Christina later, so you can mm -hmm. you have a second to think about it <laughs> before, <laughs> before I ask you. Um, uh -huh. You see from a relationship point of view or relationship manager, you still see them floating around. So there's still teams going left, right, center and being hired. Um, what yes. you also yeah. see is that it is really difficult for any management level uh, um, to, to get a job or to switch jobs because there's a compression, there's a cost, uh, a cost yes, pressure yes. In, in the market. So you see a lot of um, a lot of good people leaving but not necessarily being replaced and uh, and then they're, they have a very hard time to get uh, into the wealth management space because people think they don't need managers right now, mm -hmm. they can't afford it, they need a relationship manager with assets. Mm -hmm. At the same time, clients are conservative, they're not moving that fast. So really sure. hiring yeah. somebody with a good business plan that promises you to bring a lot of assets that's also difficult because nobody can really promise it from promise it at, at the moment mm -hmm. so it's an interesting it's an interesting situation then the whole thing slowed down anyway during covid 19. so it's yeah. an, it's an inter yeah. it's an interesting mix um, um true right um, definitely not that easy maybe maybe your yeah. view christina sure um first of all thank you for being interested in in this uh, industry and then I, I would be more than happy to to share what I know is um, in, in the past five years I see from Hong Kong is every every single bank uh, is trying to expand their private wealth uh, management business so they hire a lot of people um, so so you know when this um, expansion happened the problem at the end is some bankers are not performing, to be honest. So we can see um, that each bank um, is still trying to, um, you know, let go of those non-performing bankers. We see this all the time. But if if you are pretty confident about your relationship, the, the asset that you can bring in or the networks you can leverage, I, I don't, I, I don't want this kind of situation kind of like discourage that any of you is interested in the career in, in private banking. And uh, I think nowadays, indeed, the difficult part is, um, especially that that's like reflecting what I, um, what myself and Oliver keep mentioning the consolidation is that um, the, the budget bracket um, has the resource to make the uh, client's asset so-called sticky with them. So for example, they launch um, like a trust the service, insurance service, and then the discretionary mandate service. So when the bankers bring in the asset and then they provide a, a, a group of uh, investment specialists to, to serve the clients. So they provide multiple layers of uh, those service to the client. So for example, if today this um, bankers uh, leave JP Morgan want to jump uh, UBS, then probably the client 
won't necessarily move 100% of their asset to UBS. Um, that's more like the case now. But the good thing is I, I still have the positive view on the um, the private walls management is that, to be honest, what we just discussed a, lo a lot about the low interest rate environment, I have to be really honest that this, uh, I understand the central government, all this government is trying to stimulate the economy, but the low interest rate environment actually provide um, the best environment for those rich people to get rich here. <laughs> So <laughs> the capital gains, they just make money even faster than ever before. So uh, I think the demand is always there. So um, I, I would encourage all the people, like if you are really interested in, uh, do, do, uh, do think about your business plan because uh, uh, the banks definitely know Christina, I think we should, uh, we should start stopping here because uh, we're way sure, over sure. time. Yeah, sure. Just contact me if you really want to know more about the detail. <laughs> cool. Uh, to to take that up, there uh, there's some un unanswered questions, so we'll try to answer them uh, sure. on the chat or directly to you guys. Thanks a lot for participating. Thanks a lot to you panelists, uh, Christina and Ivan, uh, to Thank for you. this fascinating talk. I think we covered a lot of subjects, a lot of topics, but by far not 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 everything. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining. Keep uh, keep uh, making our community thrive and and yeah, stay healthy, everybody. Make yeah, sure you healthy. get some fresh Thank air you. and uh, enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.